Welcome to this new episode of Eagle Rewind. I am Josh McInerney. And I'm Parker Stone. And we want to begin this episode by talking about Grain Valley Spring Sports going on and congratulating the winter sports. Yeah, so we want to congratulate Hunter Newsom. We forgot to congratulate him in our last week's episode. But we want to congratulate him for winning state. He's the first wrestler since Maverick Alexander in 2015 to do that. Yeah, uh, Hunter deserves it more than anybody. I've never seen anybody work as hard, um, both on sports and academics, as he he does. Uh, he's a really talented kid, and um, good luck to him next year as he goes on to play Division Two football. And right now in spring sports going on, uh, we have guys and girls track, baseball, and girls soccer. This past week at the Ray Peck track meet both the boys and girls won uh the entire meet as a team wasn't even close was it it was not um i was there as a thrower and the the boys swept all of the relay races um we took a we placed a lot um of individuals and i think we won by over 50 team points for the guys and the girls um they won pretty handedly as well uh, next up, baseball. They're off to a four and three start. They were four and one, but Liberty beat them twice. Uh, pretty hard schedule, but hopefully we they can uh, keep doing their thing, keep winning some games. And also the Green Valley girls soccer team. They've gotten off to a really hot start. They are now four and zero. Oh, and what was it? they won the Platte County tournament that they, they were did. in? Yep. Yeah. So congratulations to them and good luck on all the rest of those teams for the rest of their season. So. The final four is coming up this weekend. Yep. We have Baylor against Houston, UCLA. Houston, Baylor against Houston and Gonzaga oh, yeah. versus UCLA. Um, what, are your, what, what do you think is a part of the Elite Eight games? What were like, some of the surprises? Um, I was kind of, you know, if I before the tournament had started, if you had told me UCLA would beat Michigan – after they started the first four game, I thought would have thought you were crazy. Especially, Especially since they lost four straight games heading yeah. into it. And I chose Michigan to win in one of my brackets. But watching UCLA, I've watched every single one of their games at this tournament. And after watching those, I was convinced that UCLA was going to beat Michigan just because they've been playing so well lately. Um, they're shooting really well. They're getting rebounds. They're getting defensive stops. Uh, timely turnovers. They just... Uh, they look really hot as a basketball team lately, and I kind of regretted picking Michigan after seeing the way UCLA had been playing lately. They they played very hard. Johnny Duzang, he transferred to from Kentucky to UCLA. He's a big addition to the team. I mean, he's had a little ankle ankle injuries, but he's toughened up, and he's he went off last night. Yeah, and carried them. They're gonna have a. The most difficult matchup they've had all year. They're going to be playing Gonzaga. They've won 27 straight games by double digits. Yeah. Gonzaga is now 30-0. and They were the number one team coming in the tournament, and they are proving it right now as they are just dominating teams. Um, I picked Gonzaga to win in one of the rackets. I'm going to stay with that. Gonzaga, I feel like, is unquestionably – the best team in college basketball this year and one of the best teams we've seen in quite a while. Yeah, one of the most dominant teams. I'd say top, probably top five dominant teams of all time. Yeah. I mean, um, Drew Timmy is playing his best basketball Yeah, he's right playing now. lights out. They have Drew Timmy. Jalen um, Suggs. Jalen Suggs, who almost had a triple-double the other day. He can do it all. He can shoot. He can get assists. He can get other guys going. He can get rebounds. Um, they also have Corey Kisper, who's one of the best shooters in college basketball. Gonzaga, it's just – there's so much firepower with them. Um, They're averaging like 90, 90 points a game, which is insane. Yeah, UCLA has been one of the most fun teams to watch this tournament, especially considering that they started in the first four after they narrowly beat Michigan State. Um, it, it's really easy to fruit for a team like that who is considered a big underdog going into the tournament. And for them to make it this far is pretty amazing. They're actually only the second team ever um, – to go from the first four to the final four. The other team to do that was VCU. Um, and I've been cheering for UCLA this whole time, but I think that this Gonzaga team is just too much to handle. And this Cinderella story, um, fantastic run that the Bruins have been on comes to an end this weekend. And the Gonzaga Bulldogs just put an end to another Cinderella story in the USC Trojans. And USC was on a really good run this postseason. Um, 
a lot of people were not picking them to go this far, especially me. I hadn't seen any basketball from the Pac-12 really this entire season, so I didn't know what to expect from them. But I was pleasantly surprised about USC, especially since they killed Kansas, which I um, I loved watching that. I was I was just laughing the entire time that I saw the score, especially the final score. They beat them by 30, which as a Kansas State fan, I love nothing more than KU losing like that. So um, USC, they had a really good run. They knocked off some teams like KU and Oregon, two teams that can really shoot the ball. And the two Mobley brothers, Isaiah and Evan, proved to me and the rest of the country that they are legitimate NBA draft prospects. Uh, Evan came into this regular season. He was the number two high school prospect coming out of the class of 2020. And uh, he looked really, really good this tournament. Really impressed me. And USC had a great run, but Gonzaga put it into their Cinderella story. So this weekend we have the Battle of Texas in the Final Four between Houston and Baylor. And just like a lot of people had expected, just in the preseason, we have Gonzaga and Baylor still standing, both the top two number one seeds. Um, I have both Gonzaga and Baylor moving on, but what do you think about this Baylor-Houston game? Um, I'm, like I said earlier, I think Baylor wins by about eight-ish. I think Houston, I think the straw off really slow. Baylor gets him, and I think Houston kind of settles in and then makes it at least a close game, and then Baylor pulls away. Like probably like 12 minutes left, start making shots again. Wins by 8, 15 range, somewhere in there. Yeah, I think Baylor's going to get off kind of a early lead and hold off Houston. I feel like Houston's going to make one or two runs to make it a maybe like a five-point game or something. But I think Baylor wins by 10 to 15 probably. If Houston wants to win, Quentin Grimes has to have an amazing game shooting. He's the best shooter their best offensive player. I think he has to play amazing. And their defense has to... They have to find a way to stop Jared yeah, Butler. Yeah, for sure. And he's not even their only weapon. It's just like he's the most valuable weapon. But if they stop Jared Butler and Quentin Grimes is on, I think it'll be a good game, but I'm still going to pick Baylor to win. Yeah. So we both agree Gonzaga and Baylor moving on. We do. What do you think about the championship? Um, if I'm, that's the case. If that's the case, I am very excited about it because um, if you remember in the regular season, towards the reg- towards the beginning of it, Gonzaga and Baylor were supposed to play, but Baylor had to cancel it because of COVID. COVID yep. So this is kind of like a – that I feel like in the beginning of the season when I saw that schedule, I felt like that was probably going to be a like a prequel to the national championship, and it's looking like yeah. that's what it could have been. But unfortunately, we didn't get to see that. So now we finally, most likely, most likely we finally get to see that opportunity between Gonzaga and Baylor, and I'm going with Gonzaga. Um, I believe these really are the top two teams in the country, but I feel like Gonzaga just has too much, too many athletes, too many scorers, too many rebounders, too many defensive players for Baylor to compete. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you there. I think Gonzaga wins it all. Um, Like you said, I think just the firepower from their offense. Their offense, like every single person on the floor, no matter who's on the floor, is a weapon. Sug can drive it in. He can – Dish it off to Timmy, kick it out to J I I E or Corey Cusper, Kisper, and they're just off, their offense is just so good, and their defense isn't even bad, especially as of late. But yeah, I think Gonzaga will end up winning the national championship. Yeah, and this is kind of a scary thing, but Gonzaga coming into the season, Jalen Suggs was their number, their highest recruit ever, and they just got a kid from Nebraska to commit who is. He's the top 10 player in the nation, Mm -hmm. highest player ever to go to Gonzaga. So you think that they're doing all this without getting the top recruits like Duke and North Carolina and KU always get. So now that they're, you know, probably going to win the national championship, they're going to get even these higher recruits and their coach is fantastic. He's going to coach these guys up. Mark Few, I think he's one of the most underrated and least talked about coaches. Yeah, for sure. Just Um, based off what he does, like, like you said, Jalen Suggs, their first, high, their highest recruit, and he was like you said, he was doing all that without the high recruits. Like that's just, yeah, that just shows how good of a coach he is. And I know Gonzaga has historically been a great team and always been a top seed in the tournament. But I feel like if they win this national championship, we could start seeing, I don't know about a dynasty, but 
definitely maybe like a new modern era blue blood. Yeah. Because, you know, it's always been Kentucky, Duke, KU, schools like that who are always getting the top recruits. And I feel like Gonzaga is really throwing their hat in the ring now. And they are starting to really catch on with everybody. Yeah, and Chet Holmgren, he's also a very high recruit. He's predicted to go to Gonzaga. And that's where a lot of people are thinking he's going to go. He's from Minnesota, went to the same high school that Jalen Suggs went to. They played on the same uh, AU team as well. Sizzle was the name. It was really fun to watch. I think – so if he ends up going there as well, I mean, I think it's at least another – at least one national championship in the next four years after this one. Yeah. And uh, I just talked about dynasties. How about Northwest Missouri State? Did you see what they did? They did. This past weekend, in case you guys didn't hear um, – Northwest Missouri State Bearcats, they, coming into this year, they had won two of the past three Division II national championships. This year, they went into the tournament as a two seed. They ended up winning the entire thing to become a national champion again. Um, they beat West Texas A&M, who was the one seed. Uh, they dominated them and won by 20-something. At one point, they were up by close to 40. And That's then they insane. put it, yeah. It the was, national championship and up by that much. It wasn't even close. I was watching it, and it, the game was basically over at halftime. Um, you know, Northwest Missouri State, they've always, lately they're like, they're a powerhouse in D2, both in football and basketball. Yeah. So now they've won three of the past four basketball national championships. Um, they have a local kid here from William Chrisman. Isaiah Jackson. Yep. yep. And they also have another kid from St. Joe Lafayette. So huge congrats to Northwest Missouri State on another national championship. And a lot of D1 schools who are looking for a head coach, I think they should go look at Ben McCollum, who is their head coach. Yeah, so moving on, we'll talk, talk about the Royals. Opening days tomorrow. Um, Nicky Lopez didn't actually surprise me. He got sent down to AAA. Do you think Kyle Isbell ended up starting in right field? Um, I believe Kyle Isbell should be and probably will be, but as of now, when we recorded this podcast, he still has not been added to the 40-man yeah. roster, so we'll see what happens with that. I think um, a lot of people are talking about Daniel Tillo, T- Tillo, who is a left-handed pitcher. He got hurt this spring. Um, a lot of people are saying he'll get moved to the 60-day uh, disabled li- or injured list, and that'll make room for Kyle Isbell. But if they want Irvin Santana on the opening day roster, they're going to need to make room for him as well as he is not on the 40-man roster. So I think some other guys that could possibly move, be moved off the 40-man would be Scott Blewett. Um, I don't think they will, but I think there is a very slight chance they could DFA Ryan O'Hearn. I don't, I'm not sure they really will do that. Um, yeah. You talked about Nicky Lopez getting sent down to the minors. They, you know, they are 100% behind Nicky, and they're going to do everything they can to get him back to um, how he used to hit. Back, like, he hasn't really performed well in the majors, but he was hitting over 300 when he was in AAA. So if they can figure out how he can get that bat back um, and really help out the Royals, that could be huge for them. Um, they sent him down to the player pool because minor league season doesn't start until May. So he's going to be down in Arkansas within this player pool, which is basically a taxi squad. He'll be down there for um, this month um, working out, trying to get his bat back. Um, They sent down Bobby Witt Jr., but those younger prospects like Bobby Witt Jr., Nick Prado, Asa Lacey, a lot of people, they thought that they were going to get sent to Arkansas and be part of this player pool. But actually, they're going to have another camp still in Surprise, Arizona in the spring training facility. And they're going to have like this elite prospect team between the Royals and the Texas Rangers. And they're going to play against these other young prospects for other teams. So that'll be good for those guys to get... um, you know, the competitive side of the game. They won't be just on this practice squad. They'll be actually playing these games with other top prospects, which I think will be a good learning experience for them until the minor league season comes back. For sure. Um, so, you know, the opening day roster, obviously Salvador Perez will be catcher. starting catcher yeah. as he just signed his uh, the largest contract in Royals history. Backup catcher will be Cam Gallagher. Oh, also another 40-man roster move that they could make um, – 
Mabry's Valoria. Um, I've heard some people talking about maybe DFAing him. I don't agree with that because he's still only 23 years old. But on the flip side, he's kind of like stuck in the middle because you have Salvador Perez in front of him and Cam Gallagher. But then behind him, you have Sebastian Ribeiro and MJ Mendelez, which are both Royals top 30 prospects. So he's kind of stuck in the middle of he's too young to be on that Royals roster right now and not talented enough as Cam Gallagher as in Salvador Perez, but also he's too old compared to Riviero and Mendelez. So I don't really know what they do with him. Um, and then at first base, we finally got our, our a true first baseman, Carlos Santana. Carlos Santana. Um, you know, ever since Eric Hosmer left, we've been kind of searching for that answer at first base. And they've filled in some guys, and none of them have really been able to answer the call. And they sent down Ryan O'Hearn, which is something that I have been asking for since the spring, <laughs> yes. before spring, spring training, because I'm a big Ryan McBroom fan. And Me both. Uh, McBroom did win that battle as he performed much, much better than O'Hearn. Um, O'Hearn, you know, he finished the last two games with a home run, which kind of scared me. I was like, oh, God, he's going to make it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, he ended up having, a, I think it was like a 35% strikeout rate. And I was reading this stat that said he was facing batters that were like double A and lower. So he couldn't even perform against these minor league guys. So they sent him down to the player pool to kind of to help correct him. So McBroom will be that backup answer. Second base, it looks like now that Nicky Lopez is down, Whit Merrifield will be back at second base, which... I know he's excited about because he's been True open. Position, yeah. yeah, he's been open about second base is his favorite position. That's his um, natural position. Uh, and then at shortstop, we'll have Adalberto Mondesi. I think defensively, our middle infield will be what, like top three in the game. Yeah, um, the Royals defensively are pretty stacked. Santana is he has a great bat, but I feel like a big underrated part of his game is his defensive side. Um, he'll be saving a lot of airs over there, getting scoops and everything. And then, yeah, so Montesi will be at short. And third base, Dozier, I think. I, yeah, but I still want to talk about Montesi for a second. Okay. You know, last year, Montesi, it was a shortened season. It was 60 games. So really, mm-hmm. it wasn't a whole sample size. But for the first 35, 40 games of the season, he was the worst player of baseball. He just looked lost out there. I mean, swinging up pitches in the dirt, watching pitches down the middle, making errors, making base running mistakes. And he just, it was like, what happened to him? And then in the last 20 or so games, he was, he flipped a switch and he was the hottest player in baseball. Like he did a complete 360. And it looks like he was finally the player the Royals have been waiting for. And he's carried that over into the spring. So I'm really hoping he can, keep that going during the the beginning of the season because I feel like if he can start off hot this April, um, that'll be huge for him the rest of the season because he is a five-tool guy, a true five-tool guy. He can hit for power. He can hit for contact. He can run. He can field. He can do it all. Um, and if he can put it all together, maybe we have a possible MVP candidate with the Royals. But we'll see what happens. And then, yeah, you said third base will be Hunter Dozier who is one of my favorite players on the team. I've always loved Hunter Dozier. Hopefully he can stay away from the injuries. Yeah. Um, He's been injury prone quite a bit throughout his career. If he can, back in 2019, he had the best play, the best season of his career. He hit, I think it was 26 home runs, batted 280. He was looking really good. He had, he actually had one of the highest hard hit um, percentages in the entire major leagues. I feel like he could be one of the best hitters on the Royals and even one of the top third basemen in the American League. I'm really excited to see what Hunter Dozier can do this year. And then in left field, we have Andrew Benintendi. And last year, as we all know, Alex Gordon retired. So there was like a big question mark of who the Royals left fielder was going to be. And for a while, it looks like Franchi Cordero was going to be that answer. Then they traded him along with Cahill Lee, and they got Andrew Benintendi, which I'm really excited about. He's um, fantastic defensively. Uh, He's always up there in the gold glove voting. Um, He knows how to win. 
he was with the Boston Red Sox back in 2018 when they won the World Series. So he's a good um, presence in the locker room to, you know, mentor these younger guys. Um, hopefully his he can turn around with his bat this year. Yeah, his rookie year he had an amazing year offensively. Yeah, he his first his rookie year he was amazing. His second year he was pretty he was really good. He slowly started drifting down. Yeah, from his last year. year he was really terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, so hopefully a uh, a new beginning in Kansas City, um, less pressure than Boston for sure. And he is he was talking about he's changing his plate approach back to how he had it in his rookie season. So hopefully he can get back to that. Um, 2017-2018, Andrew Benintendi. And, and huge center field, I think, Michael Taylor. Yeah, Michael Taylor had a fantastic spring. That's huge. Um, it, it was huge for the Royals, uh, for everybody. And um, I was really excited and really surprised about what he did this spring. He honestly, he was the biggest surprise of the entire um, spring training I said earlier, we just need him to bat around 220. He ended up hitting over 400 in spring. He was showing a lot of power, which surprised me a lot. He was hitting home runs, getting doubles. It was a Michael A. Taylor that I was not expecting. I'm not sure a lot of people – I don't know. I don't even know if the Royals were expecting that, to be <laughs> honest. But um, it was amazing to see that, and I'm hoping he can continue that because a guy that in center field that can field the way he can and – hit i mean obviously he's not going to hit 400 in the regular season but if he can do that in spring maybe somewhere more around like 250 to 270 in the regular season which that's a huge boost for the royals something that a lot of us weren't expecting um and he's pretty cheap he's only on like a two million dollar contract so uh even if he's performing really well and maybe the royals aren't performing as well they can trade him and get some younger prospects maybe but um a michael a taylor that can hit more above league average would be a huge huge boost for the royals could arguably be one of the biggest most valuable yeah transactions a huge this yeah that could be end up being one of the biggest offseason moves that Dayton moore makes and something that that was a signing that went under the radar for most yeah. people uh, so we'll have to see what happens with that. But right now it's looking pretty bright. And then in right field, they still – I said he hasn't – They still. he's still not on the 40-man roster, but Kyle Isbell looks like he will be the starting right fielder. And – I'm excited to watch him. I'm really excited. He, a lot, Hunter Dozier was talking about him, and he was saying that Kyle Isbell has a lot of Alex Gordon attributes to him, which is something that – Royals fans should cherish. You know, that's not something that gets said a lot. Um, a lot of people talk about his work ethic. Uh, he's a great guy in the clubhouse. He's a little bit quieter, a lot like Gordo was. He works really hard. Um, fantastic defensively. Left-handed bat with um, quite a bit of power. A young kid. Um, the outfield for the Royals is looking really good. And with Kyle Isbell starting to make a name for himself. I think that's going to be huge for the Royals. Um, and I was talking about his work ethic. You should go look at pictures of him before the Royals drafted him, right out of UNLV to after. It looks like the dude just spent all day, every day in the gym. Just kind of like Giannis. Yeah, just, <laughs> he was just pumping iron the whole time. Um, and he's really – he's got – he kept his speed. He's pretty quick. Uh, Kyle Isbell – is going to be a great player for the Royals. I think he's going to be good this year in his rookie year, but I feel like he's going to be a a big um, big piece for the Royals in the future, a big cornerstone of what they're going to build on. And then obviously de- de- designated hitter will be Jorge Soler. Um, we all know what he can do. Uh, he hit – it was 48 home runs back in 2019, so maybe if – Soler can get some of that power back. He was hurt a lot of 2020. Um, he's looked really good this spring. Did you see that one-handed home run he hit that was 400-whatever feet? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll just edit that whole thing. <laughs> so, and at designated hitter, Jorge Soler is the unquestioned player there. Back in 2019, 
he broke the Kansas City Royals record with 48 home runs. Uh, I'm really hoping he can get back to that 40 home run power. What do you think about Soler? Um, I like I love the power he 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 has. Um, the way Davis traded up working out as we now have Wade Davis again, and but if Jorge Soler can hit, I don't think he, he'll hit the season he had that year. But if he can hit pretty close to it, it'll be huge for Kansas City. I mean, it's gonna be he's gonna need to have a big bat because a lot of the Kansas City guys, like you said last podcast, I think it was they they have a really low floor but they're also a really high ceiling. So if, if he can perform to his ceiling, just like if everybody else can perform to their ceiling as fuck it. Yeah, you just talked about that Wade Davis trade, and I kind of forgot about that. The back, um, I think it was twenty seventeen. The Royals traded Wade Davis to the Chicago Cubs for this young kid who not a lot of people had heard of. His name was Jorge Soler, and I was like, okay, um, I hope it's worth it. And for the first few years, it looks like it looked like Soler was not the player that um, Dayton Moore was. Wondering. Yeah, not worth it for what we had given up. But it ended up doing it. It totally flipped. You know, Wade Davis kind of. Um, he lost the touch that he had, and his ERA was jumping up. His velocity was going down. He wasn't pitching as well. And then Jorge Soler, out of nowhere, shattered the Royals' home run record. And now we signed Wade Davis, and we have both of those guys on the team. So um, it ended up being a win-win for the Royals. And um, talking about Wade Davis, let's kind of talk about the pitching now. So opening day starter is Brad Keller. Yep. And then we'll have... I really hope he can have the season he did last year. Yeah, me too. He started the season. It was, what was it, 20-something innings yeah, of didn't scoreless. Allow a run. Yeah, he did not allow a run for 20-something innings. Um, he's, in my opinion, one of the most underrated pitchers in all of baseball. Definitely. And just because he wears a Kansas City Royals uniform, he doesn't get the credit he deserves. Uh, you know, if he was wearing like a New York Yankees or – Padres, uh, Padres any, any or Dodgers or Red Sox named, jer- yeah. jersey, he would be a big name guy who you'd hear about all the time on Sports Center and everything. But because you know he pitches for the small market Kansas City yeah, Royals, he just doesn't get the credit he deserves. So I'm hoping he can really um, put his name out there this year and prove the credit he deserves. And then day two starter will have Danny Duffy or is it Mike Miner? I think it's Danny Duffy. I'm pretty sure Duffy. Duffy. Because I know it goes right, left, yeah. right, left. Um, so I think it's Danny Duffy. And Danny Duffy, we all know what he can do. He can be a super electric pitcher. And then also at times he can give up a lot of runs. So I'm hoping we get a more consistent Danny Duffy this year. And um, we'll see what he does as a starter. It seems like a lot of people are saying he'll begin the season as a Royal starter. And then as the younger guys – like Coar and Lynch, um, work their way up into the majors. Duffy will probably get moved into the bullpen, which I think is a great place for him. Uh, and then the day three starter, Brady Singer, the Royals' 2018 first-round draft pick. I think Singer is going to have a great year. I think he'll have a little bit of a sophomore slump. But they were saying that he's been working on some new pitches. You know, typically he's been like a lot of a fastball slider guy. He's been working on his changeup a lot and a a little bit of a curveball. So I'm hoping that as he mixes in those pitches a little bit more, he'll be quite a bit more effective. Not that he already wasn't. You know, he already took a no-hitter into the ninth inning and everything. But I think Brady Singer is going to be a big piece for the Royals in the future and be going to be a great starter this year. Yeah, and he ended the spring training very well, his last start at least, especially. Yeah, five innings, yeah. no runs. He struck out a lot of guys, um, walked a couple, but he looked really sharp in his last outing and, and surprise. And then the last starter we have is Mike Miner, which was another free agent signing that the Royals got, um, bringing him back to Kansas City. Um, he's not going to be that – the old Mike Miner. <laughs> he's not going to be the old Mike Miner and be the super um, lockdown pitcher, but he's going to be a workhorse. He's going to eat up a lot of innings. Um, I think he's going to be a good fourth, fifth um, rotation guy for the Royals. Uh, really help them compete this year. And then fifth starter, we don't know yet because the Royals aren't going to need a fifth starter for a couple weeks because of all the off days. 
but it looks like it's either going to be Chris Bubich or Jacob Junis. Um, a lot of people thought it was going to be Bubich. He kind of struggled a little bit this spring. They sent him down to the player pool uh, just so that he can get on like a normal rotation because if he was up in the majors, he wouldn't be able to pitch for a couple weeks. So if he's down in Arkansas, he can stay on that rotation. And then once they need that fifth starter, call him up. But another option could be Jacob Junis. This year he's going to start in the bullpen. He's added a cutter this year, which has really helped him um, because a lot of time – his entire career, he's just been a fastball slider guy, and some teams have gotten onto that. But now that he's added this cutter, he's been quite a bit more effective and keeping hitters guessing. In spring, he looked really, really good. So um, I think the Royals keep him in the pen. If they need a fifth starter, if somebody gets hurt or something, I feel like he's going to be that first option to be moved from the pen to a starter. I agree. And then in the pen, we have the typical guys, Scott Barlow. He is, he's got a rubber arm. We talked about, um, you know, he is, last year he threw the most innings of, he had the most appearances of any bullpen pitcher last year in the major leagues. He will do anything that Mike Matheny asked him to do. Um, we, he's always a reliable guy to come out of the pen. Uh, we'll have Josh Stallmont. We'll see how he starts. He got... I don't know if you guys, if you knew this, Ethan Parker, but he had COVID really, really bad. And he showed up to surprise Arizona later than most guys. So he um, he's a little bit behind the curve right now. But it looks like he's starting to get back. He said he lost a lot of muscle. Um, he's been working on getting that back. And, you know, even if he th- loses a little muscle, he'll only be throwing 98 because, you know, he's yeah. a 102 guy. I think him being around Trevor Rosenthal last year. Oh, yeah, helped, for sure. Trevor Rosenthal was a huge, huge mentor for Stallmont just because um, Rosenthal was a lot like Stallmont when he was younger. A, a young kid who knew he threw hard but didn't really know what he had. And Rosenthal was able to show Josh Stallmont the way and just trust himself, you know. He doesn't have to pinpoint every single pitch because he throws 100 miles an hour. He can just <laughs> yeah. put it somewhere in there, and he he knows now that it's going to be a swing and miss, especially with that deadly curveball that he has. That, that outing he had against the Chicago Cubs last year was yeah. insane. His curveball is for real. I mean, it drops shoulder to dirt. And it looks the same as it does with the it, fastball. Yeah, it comes out the same, and then it just it just the bottom drops right out of it, and hitters swing over it every single time. Um, Stallmont, I don't know about this year, but I have full confidence that he will be one of, if not the best bullpen pitcher in Major League Baseball. For sure. And he's really young, too. He's, he's got a bright future ahead of him. And then we got Wade Davis back, who up until his last outing in spring had not given up a run in surprise. His ERA was, I think it was like 1.27. It was really low. Um, other guys, it looks like Kyle Zimmer will be in the pen. So the Royals bullpen, it looks like it's going to be uh, a pretty solid pen. The solid, the starting pitching looks like it's going to be really solid. The starting lineup looks really good. This Royals team is um, something that we've been waiting for for quite a while. Ever since 2015, Kansas City has been a losing ball club. And I feel like this year they really turn it around and um, give the fans something to root for. This is going to be a... Of a great Kansas City Royals team. It'll be very fun to watch. Hopefully they can keep it going into the next year's too. Get some more guys. Yeah, and this is just the beginning because they got even they got younger prospects that are still working their way up, like Asa Lacy and Jackson Coer and Daniel Lynch and Nick Prado. Um, Kyle Isbell looks like he's going to start in the major leagues this year. He's going to be a great future prospect. Bobby Witt Jr., who we haven't even talked about yeah, today. Yeah, do you think uh, do you think he'll be brought up after the two weeks? Um, I don't think after. I don't know. I don't think he will because um, for the two weeks things that he's talking that Parker's talking about in the major leagues, if a player starts the regular season in the minors for a minimum of two weeks, the Major League team gets a whole nother year of player control on that player, which in my opinion is it's t- completely unfair to the player. I I don't I, yeah, I agree. MLB teams mani- manipulate player um, 
control and everything like that, which I feel like the league needs to change. But that's a whole other topic. Um, Bobby Witt Jr., the fact that they're keeping him in Arizona – and he's going to be on this. They call they're calling it this prospect elite prospect elite team. Shows that I don't think they're ready for him to be in the majors yet because they're what they're they're basically calling this Arizona thing for the first month a this taxi squad, which is guys that are going to be called up immediately if they need help or anything. Guys like Nicky Lopez and Ryan O'Hearn and Richard Lovelady and everything. Guys that have MLB experience that. Um, can step up to the big leagues if needed. And the fact that Bobby's not there, I don't think the Royals um, want him in the majors yet just because of the room and everything. And he's not even on the 40-man roster, so they're going to have to make some moves if they want him up there. Do you think he'll at least some point in the season have I think make an appearance? I Yes, I think so, and I Me hope too. so. Me but too. I don't think it's going to be in this first, first month. I don't think it's going to be during April. I think the Royals are going to see how this prospect camp goes, and then we'll see where he gets placed. They haven't said um, for the minors in May. Um, could be double A AA or triple A. We'll see what happens with that. I think between double A AA and triple A, that'll be a real signal of what the Royals see for him this year. Um, I think if they put him in double-A, they're going to keep him there for a while. But if they put him in triple-A, I think the Royals are going to call him up maybe around August or September if he gets put in triple-A and if he performs. We'll see what yeah. happens. Um, it's a long year. There's a reason it's 162 games. Who knows? Maybe some guys get hurt and they need him to come up or he just tears it up in the minors and they have to call him up. We'll see what happens with that. Um but yeah, the this year looks really good for the Royals. The future looks Extremely amazing good. for the Royals. Uh, I'm really excited. It's a great time to be a Royals fan right now. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I'm glad Dayton Moore is our GM. <laughs> yeah, Dayton Moore. You know he's made some questionable draft yeah, picks. Yeah. But that goes for every GM. But some of the moves he's made. He really is one of the better GMs in baseball, especially with the salary that he has to spend on a team. You know, he's made moves like everybody talks about that. Way. It w- originally, it was called the James Shields trade. We, you know, we got James Shields from Tampa Bay and ended up being – we also got Wade Davis, and Wade Davis was the, the diamond in the rough that we got from that, and he helped us win a World Series. And then we turned Davis, Wade Davis around to get Jorge Soler, now and we have both. Now we have both. And we traded um, some other prospects to get Lorenzo Cain and Alcides Escobar, who were both ALCS MVPs and helped us uh, go to two World Series and win one. Some of the best players in Kansas City have been because Dayton Moore brought them here. And these draft picks that he's making lately, especially the college pitching, like Singer and Chris Bubich and Daniel Lynch – and Jackson Coar and even Jonathan Bolin and Austin Cox are looking like they're really going to work out. And even if those guys don't all make it to Kansas City, we can flip them around and use them as trade pieces for guys to help us win now. Um, and then the Bobby Witt Jr. draft pick. And he was the second overall pick. Do you know who was the first? I do not. Adley Rutschman. Oh, yes. from uh, yeah. The switch hitting yeah. catcher from Oregon, Oregon State. State. He t- led Oregon State, and they won the College World Series, and then he got drafted by um, the Orioles. Yeah, it was the Orioles. Yeah, the Orioles. And he hasn't even been playing in the Orioles spring training. So to say he, the he's been playing – yeah, he's been playing in the, the B-team games. So the Orioles don't even see him ready for the MLB – and he's much older and much more experienced than Bobby Wood Jr. So this Bobby Wood Jr. draft pick is looking like one of the best draft picks in Royals history so far. I mean, it's still way too early to yeah. say that, but it's looking amazing. And Dayton Moore um, is making some real moves and building something real here in Kansas City. We have some breaking news about an hour after we finished our recording of this episode. Um, I just got word that some very uh, disappointing news from the Royals that Adalberto Mondesi is being placed on the disabled list and the Royals are recalling Nicky Lopez. 
yeah, that uh, sigh and silence should about say it all for what I think about that. Um, I talked about earlier how Mondesi, I think, is a huge, huge piece for the Royals this year as, you know, he's like a, a true five-tool guy and he's a leader in the clubhouse and he just has that it factor that you're looking for in a player and the fact that the Royals – we're going to start the season without him is a huge, um, huge blow to the team. He is going to be sidelined with a, an uh, oblique injury. And for those of you that don't know about an oblique injury in baseball, that can be pretty substantial for a player. Um, like Jorge Soler, he had an oblique injury last year and just wasn't the same. He tried to come back and couldn't do it. He was shut down. And Bubba Starling, a guy who... <laughs> You know, has been kind of a disappointment for the Royals. Actually, probably the biggest disappointment in the Royals franchise. But um, one of the injuries that really derailed him was an oblique injury and it really shut him down for quite some time. Um, so I know it's just – right now it's just a 10-day deal for Montessi, but I would not be surprised if this um, had some lingering effects that hampered him throughout the season. This is uh, – not good news if you're a Royals fan like I am. And now we have Nicky Lopez back with the Royals. And he has a great glove. He's a gold glove caliber second baseman, but his bat just um, really holds him back and really, really hurts the team. Um, it's a huge, huge drop down from what we're going what we would have had with Mondesi at short and Merrifield at second base. Now we're going to have uh, probably Nicky Lopez at short base, shortstop, and Whit Merrifield at second base. They might flip those two around a little bit, but Nicky has the better glove, so he'll be at short. But offensively, to go from Mondesi batting second <coughs> or third, and then you shift everybody up one spot, and then now you your eight-hole hitter or nine is Nicky Lopez. That's a, a big difference offensively for a team. Um, so now you, your bottom third of the lineup is most likely Kyle Isbell, Nicky Lopez, and Michael Taylor. And you can kind of flip around Taylor and Nicky Lopez to, um, however you want. But that bottom third of the inning, that or bottom third of the lineup, that puts a lot more pressure on Kyle Isbell. Because before, if you had Montesi in there and not Nicky Lopez, um that that gave a lot of lenience to Kyle Isbell as he could kind of grow into that spot and really build up with the Royals. But now having a guy who can't really perform offensively at the big league level, in my opinion, that puts a lot more pressure on Kyle Isbell to um, hit well at that seven hole. And hopefully Michael A. Taylor can keep going what he has this spring and only – the nine hole spot with Nicky Lopez is the one that hurts. Um, but really Kyle Isbell needs, is going to have to step it up even more now. And this is going to be a huge jump for him. He's going the highest he's played in a minor league season was uh Wilmington high a ball. So he's skipping double a and triple a and probably going straight to the majors. So um, that, yeah, that's a lot of pressure on him, and I know he's ready for it, and he's got the mentality for it, but yeah. And the rest of the lineup is going to have to sit up, step it up because without Montesi getting on base, stealing bags, and hitting a couple home runs, um, that's a lot of runs that the Royals are going to lose in the first 10 games, and even possibly even more, so we'll have to see what happens with that. Um, so I'm super bummed about this news uh it really sucks for the royals um it sucks for the fan base uh it's not what you want to hear especially given that the season starts tomorrow um but we can't control it that's just part of the game uh so we'll just have to sit back and watch what happens and put our faith in the royals and uh sit back and enjoy the season. So with that, um, 
that, that kind of puts a damper on things for the Royals. But it's still going to be a really exciting weekend as this is the opening weekend for the Royals. They have a, a three-game series with the Texas Rangers. And it's going to be fun to watch. It's super exciting, especially since there's fans in the stands for the first time since 2019. As last year, COVID prohibited fans from any fans from being in the stadium in 2020. So uh, for the first time in over a year, fans will be in Coffin Stadium. And it's, uh, that's really exciting for the Royals, for the town, for everybody. Um, and then we also have the Final Four this weekend. Uh, we're going to crown a national champion, most likely. In my opinion, it'll be Gonzaga, but we'll see ha- what happens with that. And uh, baseball season is back. Thanks for listening this week to the Eagle Rewind. We'll see you guys next week.